welcome to River Reflections. I'm Rosemary Barnes. My husband Robert and I are the founders and co-pastors of the church that sponsors this program, Grand Rapids River of Life Ministries. You just saw bits and pieces of our services, our people, and we're just wanting to invite you to come and visit us at church and then you'll see a whole lot more. And if you're looking for a church home, you just might like us. We're very uh, open, expressive, give people opportunity to share from time to time what they're seeing in the Word. We got lots of musicians. If you play by ear and you like our church and you join it, you just might become one of them. I've told my husband, I don't care if the entire church becomes one big music uh, band I don't because we have a good time playing together tonight the subject I want to bring to you and I want to get right in it because it's extremely important the topic is about the deity of Christ this is a Bible study and the fact is the one thing that separates Christianity from every other religion is that we have a living Savior he was killed in order to pay the price of our sin because the Bible says the wages of sin is death and if we who are sinners born in sin David the prophet Psalmist King said I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity all of us are sinners we come into the world as sinners and because the wages of sin are, is death, all of us deserve to die and go to hell and be separated from God eternally. Now that's the message of the Word of God. Um, I happen to believe the Word of God is infallible and I believe it and trust God when He says that He sent Jesus Christ into the world not to condemn the world. Actually, the world was already condemned. He sent Jesus to save the world from condemnation. And the way Jesus Christ did that is he died on the cross and he came back to life again. They put him in a tomb. They come by later. The stones rolled away from a big old heavy stone from the entrance of the tomb. Jesus was resurrected. He then later was ascended to the Father. He sits at the right hand of the Father even now. But it wasn't long after he ascended on the day of Pentecost, he sent us his spirit to give us power to walk in him and do his works. Jesus Christ is the only God who took on human flesh, paid the price for our sin, and then turned around and gave us of his spirit that we might be one with him. And you might say, Jesus is God. Yeah, Jesus is God. In the very beginning in the Bible, in Genesis, when the Bible says, let us make man, that us there is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together creating man, us. Bible says in another place, um, hear all Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's Ehud. I may not pronounce that exactly right if you happen to speak Hebrew. It's spelled E-H-U-D. And that's a, a unity. Uh, when it says, let us make man, that's Elohim. That's a plural word for God who is one in unity. And Jesus even prays that we may become one with He and the Father in the Spirit. All of us one. The Spirit of Christ making His home in us. The Father making us His home in us. They are one. As I shared with church when I, my church when I was preaching on this topic recently. It's something that our mind cannot really wrap itself around. So there's a lot of people that, oh, maybe Orthodox Jews, for instance, that look at us and go, oh, they're polytheistic. They have three gods. No, we have one God. He's one who manifests himself in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says these three are one. We have one God. And I'm well aware of the fact that people think of all kinds of illustrations. Matter of fact, they think of, 
of water that can appear in the form of steam, water like I'm holding, and also ice. But it's still all the same thing, the same substance in three different forms. Well, you might be able to get a little more understanding when you think of it like that. But the fact is, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ is God. They're one. Let me share some scriptures with you to talk about these things. Now, Jesus knew very well who he was because he said uh, in Luke 24, 25, the Bible says that he said to some people that he was walking with, then he said unto them, Jesus is speaking, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? The Lord Jesus, now he was speaking to some people after his resurrection right here in Luke 24. But the Lord Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He knew why he was here. And he knew that the prophets had prophesied exactly what he was going to go through. That he'd be a suffering servant at one point. And then when he comes back again, he's going to be a glorified king. He's already glorified. But he's going to be, he is the king of glory. And he's going to come back as the king of kings and the lord of lords. But first he had to suffer. And he knew that the prophets in the Old Covenant writings were pointing to him. I'm saying this too so that as you read the prophets in the Old Testament writings, make sure you look for uh, prophecies that point to who is the Christ. Now, of course, there was no Jesus in the Old Covenant. Jesus was the baby that Mary birthed, but within Jesus was the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God, He was deity. God was His Father. That's why we call Mary the Virgin Mary because she knew no man intimately in order to conceive Jesus. The angel, I believe it was Gabriel, came to her and said, the Spirit of God will come upon you and you're going to um, have a baby and you're going to call His name Jesus. It was God who fathered Jesus. He's the Son of God. I find it interesting that the devil duplicates just about everything that God, in fact, has done. Because when you read ancient myths, you find old Greek uh, gods who birth sons. And there's a lot of duplication in Greek mythology of what, in fact, became true with Christianity. I just find that interesting that the devil seems to have to create a myth for everything that God, in fact, did. But then Jesus goes on to say in verse 27 of Luke 24, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now I would exhort you to not listen to any preacher or anyone that says the Old Covenant writings are passé. That is a lie. The enemy does not want you to see the things in the Old Covenant that refer to Jesus. There are whole passages from the Old Covenant that I could share with you to share salvation, barely having to even refer to the New Testament writings. It's sufficient what the Old Covenant says about the New Covenant and about the Christ and what He's going to do to save people from their sins. It's sufficient. He was wounded for our transgressions. He bore our iniquities. That's out of Isaiah, that passage. The New Covenant. I'm going to put a new spirit in them. I'll give them a new heart. I'll cause them to walk in my statutes. That's out of Jeremiah 31. Those are Old Covenant writings referring to the New Testament in the blood of Christ. A lot of Christians don't realize that. How much is in the Old Covenant referring to Christ? The, in the Psalms, he's all over the place. Speaking of the Christ, thy throne, O God. That's in the Psalms, and it's repeated in Hebrews. Maybe I'll get there. I hope I get there. But there's tons of things talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Covenant writings. Uh, 
particularly if you're a Jewish person, read Isaiah 53 and then read the Gospels and see what Jesus Christ went through and what it's predicted about him that he's going to go through. And you'll see Isaiah, Isaiah 53 talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very clear. Just now, the thing I alluded to about thy throne, O God, that's the next verses I have here in Psalms 45, verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. By the way, when you read in the um, Old Covenant writings about God promising a David a seed on his throne forever and ever, I think he repeats this, the promise to Solomon. That's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. When the, I think it's in Matthew, when it opens up, it talks about, um, let me look that up a minute so I can show that to you. So you can see when it talks about the coming king, it's talking about the Christ. It says right in Matthew 1, verse 1, first verse of the whole New Testament, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ is the seed of David. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. It was to that seed that the promises that were made to David and the promises that were made to Abraham, they're all fulfilled in Christ and were in Christ too. So all the believers in Christ, that's something for you to really think about and develop yourself. I'm going to move on again to the deity of Christ. Psalms 45 verse 6 Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou loves righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Kings greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. Now, that's a strange verse, isn't it? Because it starts out saying, Thy throne, O God, talking to the Christ. And you'll see that for sure in a minute in Hebrews 1, verse 8, that that's exactly who's being talked to. But later on it says, Therefore God thy God hath anointed you with the oil of gladness. Well, isn't that something that the Son is God, and then God, the Father, is also referred to the God of Christ. And it's true, there's a verse in the New Covenant that talks about the head of Christ is God, the head of every man, is Christ. That's a verse in the New Testament. Well, Jesus Christ, when he became a man, he voluntarily took upon, even though the Bible says it would not have been robbery, I, think, I believe this is in Philippians, for him to have called himself God, to be equal with God, he voluntarily took upon himself the form of a servant goes on to say that, that the reward for this is that every knee is going to bow to him because he chose to become man so he could taste death for all of us so we wouldn't have to pay the price of sin. But here in Hebrews 1, Psalms is repeated. The Psalms 45, 6 that I just read. Hebrews 1, verse 8. But unto the Son, he says, God says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Remember I told you before, Jesus Christ is the seed, the promised seed of David, to whom will be given the everlasting kingdom that Daniel promised about, prophesied about, the kingdom that's never ever going to end. And God here in Hebrews 1 verse 8 makes it plain that the Psalms 45 passage refers to the Son of of God. There's another verse in Psalms that talks about kiss the son lest he be angry with you. Kiss is another word that like to pay homage or worship the son. In Isaiah 7, again an old covenant verse, please I'm going to say it again, read the Bible from cover to cover. It says in Timothy all scripture is profitable for instruction, for doctrine, for reproof. Do not leave the scripture out. And there will be passages that you're going, what? And if it gets too, too complicated for you, keep going till you find the one that makes sense. The next set, keep reading that. You know what? As you go through it over and over again throughout your lifetime, things will start to make sense that didn't make sense three, four years ago. This is a lifetime learning project, not just, I will read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That's not how that works. It's 
constantly because that Bible, there are layers and layers and layers of layers of understanding to be had. It's never ending and you read it over and over again. Just read it. Now in Isaiah 7:14 it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Remember I said before, it was from the Virgin Mary. This is an Isaiah predicting this virgin conceiving. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Do you know what Emmanuel means? It means God with us. Now, that verse is repeated in Matthew 1, verse 23. It says in Matthew 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, hopefully, when you're listening to a Bible study, you got a Bible near your TV on your coffee table or something, if it's been used for genealogy and rarely to actually read, now's a good time to actually read the Bible. I, right now, I'm looking up the uh, context for, um, actually, I'm going to read a little bit more of the context here so that you know what was happening in the midst of that being said to him. It was the angel of the Lord in verse 20 that appeared um, to Joseph saying, Thou son of David, Fear not to take to thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. And then he goes on to say in 22 of Matthew 1, this is being said to fulfill the prophet, saying, and that's what I just read about the virgin shall bring forth a son. And the prophet being quoted here, of course, is Isaiah, because I read to you Isaiah 7, 14. And you know what? Those folks knew the word of God. They knew the old covenant writings. They knew that Isaiah had prophesied that. It said that every woman in Israel, when they had a baby, was hoping that they were the one to have the Messiah. Now here's Joseph being told, you're it, buddy. You're the one that's going to have this Emmanuel that was prophesied in Isaiah 7:14. And don't forget, I just told you what Emmanuel means. It's very clearly God with us. Plus, the angel said to Joseph in verse 20 of Matthew 1, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. God is having a baby. Joseph technically was Jesus' stepfather because his father, Jesus' father, was God himself. Jesus is the Son of God. There's... Um, times Jesus or somebody else said that and people knew some people considered that blasphemy because that knew they knew that was making himself equal with God the fact he had been conceived by the spirit of God you've got to get that don't just hear the Apostles Creed or the word Virgin Mary and blow it off like you just walk past a coca-cola sign or something think about what that actually means <coughs> concerning Jesus Christ. The neatest thing about that is him being God and all, and he ascended to heaven, he's our best and closest friend. He's ever in interceding for us, the very one who created us and knows us. He is God. That is pretty heavy if you think about it. Isaiah, same prophet, chapter 9, verse 6, Speaking of Jesus Christ, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His, now check his name. He shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall, contain, shall perform this. This is going to happen. One day that one that was the son given to us, that was prophesied in the seventh chapter and again in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, one day 
This son is going to set up on David's throne and there's going to be no end to this kingdom. As I said before, that kingdom is prophesied in Daniel. Again, if you're an Orthodox Jew, read those chapters in Isaiah and you tell me what in the world would that mean except that God is going to have a son. His name is Emmanuel. It goes on to say in chapter 9 of Isaiah, he is the everlasting, it says, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, referring to the, for unto us a child is born. In other words, a child is going to be born in history, whose name is Emmanuel. He is the everlasting Father. He's God wrapped up in the flesh. He is the mighty God, and he's the very one that one day is going to sit on the throne in, of David. Now get, start to try to figure that one out. And you know what you're going to have to do to figure anything out to even believe it is cry out to God the Father, our Creator, and say, show me what does this mean? And if you are shown by the Lord, he will show you that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. He was perfect in all his ways. He completely fulfilled the law of Moses. He never broke it. There had to be a perfect lamb, the picture of the, Pass the fulfillment of the Passover lamb, who would take away the sins of the world. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, wrapped up in flesh, became our Redeemer, the Redeemer of Israel. He is our God. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be so busy coming against it that you don't have enough sense to study it out for yourself. You know what, for some of you, for instance, if I don't know why I keep wanting to address you who are Jews and don't believe in God the Son, but right now I do. For you who are, are Jewish and if you're Orthodox, I've been told that if people are really strict in that particular, you know, I know there's Reformed and Conservative and the Lubavitchers, I think they're kind of Orthodoxy-ish for sure. Uh, there's other, there's different kinds, denominations, I guess you would want to say, like if you make it like the Protestants, uh, Christians, but those of you that are in families that may literally have a funeral for you if you begin to check out who is Jesus Christ and find out he is God in the flesh and you ask his spirit to live inside of you it's possible your family has a funeral for you and your name doesn't get spoken anymore in that household but my question to you is how many more years do you think you're going to live on this earth now if you're 30 right now Chances are 70 years from now you're not going to be here or it'll be just a little while if you are before you go on back to your maker one way or the other. So that's 70 years of your family doesn't get it. You're going to have to pray for them to get it, but it, just in case some don't, that's only 70 years compared to an eternity of having rejected your Savior who died for you to pay for your sins so you didn't have to pay for them yourself with death and hell, everlasting death, so to speak. Eternity, how many 70 years is that? What is worse, having your name not spoken in your family and them having a funeral for you? And for the next 70 years, of course that's going to hurt. Of course you love your parents and your grandpa and your grandma and your siblings and, your, and all of them. Of course you love them. But... Life is temporary. Eternity with God is where it's at. You need to find out the truth of how to be reconciled to God and become part of his family. You've got to find out the truth. And in your Old Covenant books, it's very clear that Jesus Christ is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Isaiah 9 verse 6. Isaiah 40, verse 9, owes the one, the returning with the rewards for a life lived in the Spirit of Christ. Isaiah 40, verse 9, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, 
that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah. And that's what I just did. Say to the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Behold the Lord God will come with strong arm. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. His work is before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He'll gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. Gently lead those that are with young. Now, we often call Jesus the shepherd. Look over in the New Covenant writings in Revelation 22, verse 12. Very clear who's bringing the reward. Just now, God said he was. In Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. I'll give to every man according to what he's done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In verse 16 of Revelation 22, it's very clear who's talking. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. Jesus Christ is saying, I'm the Alpha, I'm the Omega. My reward is with me. In Isaiah, God says to um, people, say to Judah, behold your God. He's coming with a strong hand. His arm shall rule for him. His reward's with him. Who's the arm of the Lord? Well, who's going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Who's the seed of David? Who's going to sit on David's throne and rule forever and ever? Jesus Christ the Lord is the arm of God part of the body of God. We are part of the body of Christ. Christ is in God. God is in him. We are in Christ. In fact, the Bible even talks about us being in Christ, partakers of his divinity. We are not divine. We are not gods. But in Christ, we partake of his divine nature through communion with the Holy Spirit. Find out who Jesus Christ is. Find out. That's very important for you to know so that you can have his spirit in you and you can spend all of eternity with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.